Let's pray. Loving Lord God, we thank you that your word to us is challenging and it's exciting and it breathes new life into us. We pray that as we open your word this day, that you would speak through it, that you would speak through me and the preparation and the singing and the prayers, that you would meet us here and challenge us again this day. Amen. I do uh, have a great, a great word for you today. I'm very excited about uh, the message in a sense. Uh, I just hope I can get it across as well as, or as you know, neatly as I have it in my head. So uh, that's you know, one of the reasons we pray, I guess. Um, so hopefully you were praying for me as well. This morning's passage follows on directly from last week. Uh, this is the second uh, in this passage, where the second time where Jesus pr- predicts his death and, and also his resurrection uh, and his suffering. And, and it explicitly says here, the disciples don't understand it. Uh, just as they did, didn't understand last week. And you remember uh, Peter tried to rebuke Jesus and then Jesus rebuked Peter, uh, all because they didn't quite get this concept of Jesus' suffering and death. And, and because of that, they didn't understand what the resurrection was going to be either. And this is the second time Jesus has tried to teach them about that. And then we hear this conversation that it leads to amongst themselves about who would be the greatest. And it shows that they still really haven't got it. This notion of Jesus giving himself for others has completely passed them by. And they're talking about who is going to be the greatest, who might stand in Jesus' stead, who might you know, go as one of his emissaries or be his his second in command, perhaps. And Jesus asked them and they, uh, they pretend, oh, we weren't talking about anything. Uh, and that, again, is another clue. They realise what they were talking about was somehow inappropriate. They were ashamed of it. But Jesus knows what it was anyhow and starts to uh, teach them according to what they were arguing about. And the first thing he says in his response out of two sayings, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last and the servant of all. And whoever welcomes one of these little children in my name welcomes me. Whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, that is God. Well, When I got to this passage at the start of the week, just that simple notion of welcome, I guess stuck with me uh, as I've been seeing, as I'm sure you have, over and over the refugee crisis, images and words and theories, uh, conversations with friends and neighbours, people at your work, And like me, if you have been talking to friends and neighbours, you've probably heard, you know, the full spectrum of people's thoughts about, oh, well, I'd have a refugee family come and stay with me if I had a a spare room or whatever. We'd put them up. And I heard people ringing radio stations saying exactly that. We want to have, you know, a couple of families in our little town and we will look after them. We want to make space for them. And I thought, fantastic. Uh, right to the other extreme of people saying, you know, we, we shouldn't be worrying about it. We should just send them back. Give them a machine gun. Send them back. Sort out their own problems. We don't want to get involved. And maybe you've heard uh, all the variations in between. And we can see different countries, their neighbours directly, are doing either their welcoming Uh, and setting up all sorts of things to make a space for them. Others are stringing up fences and patrolling. And this morning's passage to us, the word of God uh, that was 
uh, chosen, if you like, over 400 years ago when a, when a council sat down and said, oh, well, we think we should have some order in the, you know, in the lectionary and go through the passage or systematically, was this passage about welcome. So let's not pretend that God's spirit doesn't work through councils and through our church over even generations and generations. Or that God has something to say to us and our situation this day through ancient words. See, the first saying that Jesus gives to his disciples is a reversal, if you like, of what they would have thought and what they were arguing about, being the greatest. And it's a point in his, in his leadership and in the way that he was trying to teach them that they had missed. He wasn't going to put himself first. He was going to put himself last. And he was going to be the servant of all. But the second element, this business about welcoming a child, is more surprising than the reversal. For a religious teacher and, you know, su surrounded by his male disciples, it's actually rather shocking that he would, that there would even be a child present. He might have had to grab a child who was, you know, lurking in a corner or something. Uh, who knows? But the idea is that the child should not have been there in the first place. That's why the, the passage says Jesus sat down and then said this. It means he was assuming a teaching role. He was assuming a formal, right, I'm going to teach you blokes a lesson now. Let's, let's get our books out. And he sits down to do that very formal thing. Yet somehow, somewhere, there's probably a child of a of you know a young servant girl and he takes that child and we're told he embraces the child and says whoever welcomes a little child like this and he gives it a squeeze says welcomes me children were a non person Children should have been, I guess, with the women, if uh, anywhere, not out there. You see, the disciples could have understood uh, if Jesus said, well, if an emissary comes in my name, you need to welcome him as though he was me. That's completely understandable. That's completely logical and normal for their, for their society and their culture. If Jesus said, if I have a second in command and he goes in my place to, to a town to spread the word, that town ought to be welcoming him as if he was me. And you remember in Matthew's Gospel, he says something very similar to his disciples about how they might be welcomed by the towns around them. But here in Mark's Gospel, Jesus turns it around and says, how you welcome a little child is how you welcome me. See, an emissary is a position of power, of, uh, of standing. But a little child, an infant, a toddler, to their eyes would have been nothing. Socially, a child of that age would have been invisible. And Jesus says, this little child, this little stumbling toddler is going to stand in for me. In terms of your discipleship, whether you're really a follower and doing what I'm doing, this little child is a great stand in for me. Will you welcome a little child like this? <coughs> There's a story in the Old Testament about a woman who was a good host. Uh, she saw this man of God, his name was Elisha, and uh, as he was passing through her little village, she said, look, why don't you come in for a meal? I'm a great cook, I'd love to have you. We've got a big room, come in for a meal. So Elisha does. Uh, and she goes to her husband 
and says, look, this man of God is coming through our town all the time. Uh, and I'm sure he's, he's a real prophet. Uh, we should make space for him. Why don't we build on an extra room? Uh, and they're a wealthy family, so they build on an extra room. And she says, Here's, this is your room. We put a bed in it, we put a desk and a chair and a lamp. Any time you're passing through, we want you to come and stay with us. And so Elisha does. And then uh, he's so impressed with her welcome and with the, the welcome of this family. He goes to the woman uh, through his servant and says, you know, what can I do for you? I want to repay you. Do you need a, a good word put into the king or to a, uh, a commissioner or something? And she says, no, no, I, you know, I spend all my time here in, in our little village. It's not fussed about kings. Uh, we're, we're, all, we're all set. We're, we're wealthy. We've got everything sorted out. Elijah's servant says to him, well, you know, she's getting on a bit and her husband's really old. They've got no son. What about it? Elisha says, that's a great idea. Let's give her a son. Tell, call her over and tell her, I'll tell her the good news. And so they do. And he says, this time uh, in, in its season, you know, we know nine months. He says, in your season, you will embrace a son. She says, what's that, sonny? I can't, I've got to turn my hearing aid up. He says, uh, in his season, you're going to have a son. And she says, have you seen my husband? Do you know how old he is? That's her response. It's in the Bible. It's two kings. You go and read it. I'm not making it up. Anyhow, she, she has a son. I guess the point is, if you're going to welcome a man of God, you want to be careful about it. Uh, and, you know, if you're going to uh, welcome a man of God in, I mean a real one, you know, who's actually not not pretending but is actually creating the kingdom of God where he goes, you do want to be careful. I mean, a cup of tea and nice biscuits, well, that's all good. Uh, be wary about sleepovers, though. <laughs> I heard another great story of welcome. There was a, a Methodist church, and uh, they were worried about the homeless people in their district, in their community. And they kept seeing them lying around and they thought, well, we've got this great big hall. Why don't we just offer that they could come and, s and sleep in our hall? And the council talked about it and they thought, seems like a good idea. The minister wants to give this a, a whirl, let's do it. So they opened their doors to these homeless men. Well, the first night, 55 homeless men came into their hall to sleep. Um, and they realised that there was a reason that they were homeless. Uh, because they stank and they, uh, they didn't have good manners. Some of them were kind of crazy. Uh, all sort, you can imagine all sorts of things, are reasons why these people were out on the streets, came home to them. Now they thought they were just going to be nice and you know, offer you know, a warm, safe place for them to sleep. That first night, uh, there were scuffles, there were fights, people were grumpy, uh, things got broken, and uh, it didn't go so well. What happened, you might ask, as someone did ask of the minister? What happened? Well, we became a church was the response. We really only had two choices. We could either throw them all out or do what was necessary to be the kind of place that offers a welcome, that shows hospitality to 55 homeless people. The minister said our congregation was converted from a friendly religious club that was looking after its building nicely into a committed, bold, real church. Because we opened our doors to some homeless people, uh, guess who came in with them? I imagine it's the one who said, whoever welcomes in my name one of these little children welcomes me. So 
So I'm wondering, in your life, is there a knock at the door? I'm wondering if there's a stranger outside. It might be you know who. The one who says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Welcome a little child or a person in need, uh, someone invisible, and you welcome me. But make no mistakes, when you welcome Jesus in, the living God, the real one, you may not get what you expect. You may be in for a conversion, like that old lady who had a very swift trip from the uh, octogenarians club into the maternity ward. You may get a very swift trip from a nice, ordered, sensible, religious club to a real church, to a real home, to a real welcome. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Do you want to let him in? Let's let him in. What harm could it do? We're going to spend some time in prayer for others. Uh, Linda and Andrew are just going to play quietly in the background. And I'll lead us in our prayers. Let's pray. Father, teach us to be welcoming people. For all the refugees, Lord God, for all the suffering in this world. Give us a heart of compassion. Lord, for those who are sick and broken and in need, May we open our doors, our hearts, our homes. For all our friends and family that are going through colds and flus and illness and surgery, we lift them to you and we pray that your healing transformation would come. For all those families on the road, for all those children stumbling and tired and hungry and scared, we pray for our nations and for the welcome that is offered to them at checkpoints and at borders. We pray for your love and compassion. You're welcome.
Lord God, into our hearts and into our homes, into our lives, we say, come. And while it might be scary and we don't know what you might call us to do or be or become, Lord God, we take that little first step in faith. Hesitant even, nervous, but we open the door to you, Lord God, and we invite you in that you might take us and make us into what you would want and what this world needs. Amen.